lean in tonight. We part four of whatever happens. If you have missed any of it, don't worry. It will catch you up and bring you up to speed now. But I would encourage you, go and jump on our YouTube page. Catch up with all the past sermons. They've been excellent. They're 20, 25 minutes. It's, it's shorter than an episode of The Office. So you, you want to jump in. It's, it's brilliant. And I really believe that Netflix has got nothing on the preaching of the Word of God in this time. So why don't you open your Bibles and your hearts. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 to 30 is what we're reading tonight. So I'm going to read it all in one go. And then we're going to make sense of it together. It says this, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill His good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I'll be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope therefore to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it is necessary to send back to, send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. So then, welcome him in the Lord with great joy, and honor people like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. And that ends Philippians chapter 2. Let me give you some context very quickly to bring us up to speed, some reminders that Paul is writing this narrative, this letter to the church in Philippi and, and consequently on, on, onto us as well as for New Testament followers of Jesus in this present day. He's writing this letter from a jail cell. And uh, as we've been saying and declaring, this is not some light and fluffy uh, Christianese epitaph that's put out to us. It's not just a, a few verses from Twitter just to keep us going. No, no. He is writing in, down in grimy, in the dirt, in the real soil of our lives. He's writing something really real to us, a manifesto for joy to a people in Philippi at that time who are under pressure politically, economically, emotionally, and spiritually. This is a man who's in jail himself, but also the people he's writing to are facing so many other things, pulling at their emotions, pulling at their political agendas. If we think it's hard now, these Philippians had the same sort of attacks, the same sort of pressures, just minus the Instagram accounts. This is the world that they are facing, and it's incredible what Paul is trying to do in this whole letter. As we've been saying week in and week out, that he is wanting to rewire their hearts and, and, and consequently our, our hearts and our lives to joy. He's rewiring our hearts to joy. He, and I, I love what Paul's writing underneath all these, these incredible lines, these one-liners that are so beautiful and encouraging. He is writing this, this deep understanding that he's saying that we are not prisoners to Rome. That he said, ultimately, we're not prisoners to the government. We're not prisoners to the economy. We're not prisoners to our reputation. We're not prisoners to our emotions at this time. No, he says, we are prisoners of the Lord. There's a higher reality. There's a higher truth that Paul is trying to put deep into our hearts. And he is saying at this time, and I look deep into the camera at you, sir, ma'am, you are a prisoner of the Lord. You are constrained to his will, to his purposes. You're a prisoner of his hope. You're a prisoner of his promises. And ultimately, you're a prisoner of joy. Yeah. That is what he has got for us. Whatever happens, Come on. whatever happens, you're a prisoner of joy. Come on. And I want to say, I'll appear on the screen next to me now, but this incredible passage that I've just read, these 18 or 19 verses flow out of the soaring poem in chapter 2, the, what Mark called in the first week the, the gravitational center of this whole book about Christ and, and his, his laying down his nature, his nature and His life for us on our behalf and God giving Him the name above all names. And it comes out of that narrative, out of that poem, 
and the section I just read can be broken up into three parts. You'll see it on the screen next to me now. There we oh go. My. Beautiful. Look at it. It feels like a touch screen there. And uh, three things, that I, and this is how simply I read the Bible. I get my pen and I write this over each section of the Bible so I can d correctly divide the word of truth, so I can correctly see what the logic of the argument, what he's trying to say, because I don't know about you, but I can get lost in some of this. But I want to know, okay, what is going on? So the first section is a new command, a fresh command for our joy that Paul's giving us, verse 12 to 13. Then he gives us a fresh charge, a fresh encouragement, a, cre a fresh pursuit in verse 14 to 18. Yeah. And then he gives us a new insight as, he, yeah. as we read there about Timothy and his deep affection for Timothy and Epaphroditus and them laying their lives down for the gospel and him wanting to send them back to the Philippian church of this a fresh new vision of what the potential of what community can be. And it's this incredible understanding. And uh, as we look at this narrative, we break it down. We're going to be zoning in on the first one and making our way through it. I want to pray that, that these words would become more than words, but would, would put flesh and blood on our faith, if I can say it that way. So, Father, I pray for the, thank you for the preaching of your word. I thank you that your word never returns to you void. But I pray for the hearers of the word, mine included, God. Yes, would God. I hear what the Spirit is saying to the yes, church God. tonight? And would I make the necessary adjustments by yeah. the power of your spirit, by the power of your grace, yeah. so that we are, would be able to yeah. lay a hold of a whatever happens kind of joy. Come on. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Right. So verse 12 to 13 are potentially, as I've been reading it again and again this last couple of weeks, are quite potentially some of my favorite verses in the Bible. They are so uh, emotionally charged. They're so charged full of joy and of power. But I feel that they so often are misunderstood. Their verses on, when they've been taken out of context, are misunderstood very quickly, and people can do a lot of damage with them. So I want to help us activate the joy that is in this verse before we move on. And it starts off, the text starts off with this one line that says, therefore, therefore, and before we go anywhere else, the question is all as, as, as uh, people, uh, scholars of the word will often tell you in a very cheesy kind of way, but it's so helpful. Whenever you see the word therefore, you have to ask, what is it there for? It's serving a purpose. Oh. This is linking. It's not isolated. That is telling us that this is a, a run-on thought. It's not just a one-liner, here we go, boom, drop the mic, take it and go. And too many people build their faith like that, build their theology on one-liners. When actually, that's the power of reading Scripture in context, reading books at a time, going line by line, because we realize Paul, in, in this occasion, is building on his argument. He's flowing on from something. And, uh, and, and it's incredible when we see the word, therefore, he's basically saying, in view of what has just come before, X, Y, Z. Then we're going to move on with what, what my command, what the fresh command will be to you as believers. And I want to ask us, what has just come before? What is fueling this command that is coming? Well, I'll tell you, I'm glad you asked tonight, Life Changes Church. I want to tell you that it, there's two things that come before. We find the example of Jesus Christ. He's saying in view of the example of Jesus yeah. Christ, which we read about in chapter 2, he says, he, he gave up his divine privileges, taking on the nature of a servant, humbling himself in obedience to death on the cross. We have his, in view of his example, but also in view of his exaltation, we, what do we say? God exalted Christ to the highest place of honor. He gave him the name above all names, that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. So in view of those two things, Christ's example, him becoming low, and Christ's exaltation of him being exalted to the highest place, in view of those two things, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Yeah. In view of his, his, his exaltation and his example. And I just want to, before we even move on into that, there's that line. It says, in chapter verse 11, it says that Jesus is Lord. Every tongue will confess Jesus is Lord. It is the greatest piece of theology that you'll ever need to know. Jesus is Lord. The shortest and the greatest piece. If Come you on. get this deep in your heart, because yeah. when Paul was saying that, I can imagine them reading that letter for the first time. They've got the letter from Paul and it's being read out to him and they're listening and he's rewiring their hearts to joy. They hear about Jesus. It's like, yes. And then he gets that phrase, Jesus is Lord. Now, Philippi was a Roman colony. And in that day, there was a phrase that they would say, a politically charged phrase. They will say, Caesar is Lord. And it was to align people to Rome, to keep their hearts in line with what Rome had in, in place, what Rome decided to keep, make sure they were loyal to, to the political power of the day. 
But it's this incredible, incredible understanding. When you, when you read this, this narrative, this, he says, Jesus is Lord. It's, a, it's this most provocative, dangerous, huge implication type phrase that I think would have taken their breath away. Shock. They would have looked wrong. What, what is he saying? Not only is it, yes, a spiritual thing, but it's a, it is this incredible understanding that it was coming against not just one day when, but the powers and principalities of the day that they lived in. Yeah. This was so huge. And I, and I want to tell you, it's just as huge for you and I today. It's so huge because maybe we're not walking around and maybe we are some people, but maybe we're not saying this guy is king or that is king. But I want to tell you in the spiritual, we have to make a decision. Is Jesus Lord? Because if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. And we've got to do that. And I want to tell you that the king is coming back again. The king is coming back again. And uh, one day I've got this vision. I've, I've got this vision. Yes, thank you, guys. Very distracting for me. So Come stop on. that. I know. Come on. Thank you. You're doing well, Gabe. Thank you very much. But this incredible understanding of the, of, the, of the Bible is this, that we have this understanding that Jesus is coming back. He's coming back again as king. He came the first time as suffering yeah. servant, but he's coming again as conquering king. Jesus is Lord Come with on. a name that is above every other name, and the trees of the field will clap their hands. I've got this understanding. The Psalms say it poetically, but I've got this vision of when Jesus appears in glory, that the trees of the field will pull their roots out and will start clapping because they will say, we've all been waiting and groaning for his revelation. The rocks will cry out. Can you imagine the rocks will start to open their mouths and start to cry out? And every knee will bow. Ours will bow willingly, but every knee, some will bow unwillingly because they'll have their kneecaps broken. Because they'll see him, but every knee will bow because Jesus is Lord. This is huge for us. And we have to, I want to say in this moment, when we see him as Lord, then but also now, Every sickness, every sin, every struggle, every squabble starts to find its right place. It does not so that it defines us because actually those things might happen to us. But whatever happens, Jesus Lord defines me. This is the truth for you and I. And this, this text goes on. It says, therefore, so therefore, in light of his example and his exaltation, this of a, of a servant laid low and a king raised up, I want to tell you, he says, my dear friends, my beloved, people he de- deeply loves, my agapetos, the people I love deeply. He said, you have always obeyed, not just in my presence, but now in my absence as well. And it's this incredible, beautiful, beautiful thing that he says there. And I just a quick aside, I want to say, I know this well as a, a parent of young kids. and I've also been a teenager myself. And maybe you've got teenagers, teenagers home. But, you know, when you're looking, when mom and dad are looking, they'll behave. Yeah. And when they look away, they try to cut corners. And teenagers think that when mom and dad are out, woohoo, freedom, I can do what I want. But what we showed here, that that is an immature version of freedom. That Paul is saying that actually I thank God for you that when I'm not even there, you're still obeying. And it shows that that's a maturity and being able to handle freedom. We've been free and we're able to handle that freedom. But then he gets to the juicy part. And it's the next slide. It says this, in view of what has come before, his example and his exaltation. Here it is. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, first glimpse of me, you can see I'm not a fan of the words workout. I don't like seeing the word workout. Because it often starts to get me in a cold sweat, and I'm like, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there, you know. I'm happy with the way I am physically. But all jokes aside, I think many people also struggle with those words in in terms of faith because they've just bought into a one-dimensional understanding of what salvation is. They bought into this understanding that it doesn't have much implication to the here and now. It's almost a get-out-of-jail-free card one day when. So I, I can escape the fires of hell one day when. So we've, we've put that in. We've put it in the date in the Bible when we got saved. And we almost said, that's it. Great. I'll attend church. I'll do the, I'll do the Christian hokey pokey. Turn it all about. But I, I'm not going to actually, I don't want to put any effort into this thing. I don't want to lean into what God is calling me. And then we wonder why our faith falls apart. And when, when, when situations happen, when sickness happens, when life happens to us, when complications happen. Why? Because we've built no muscle onto our faith. We haven't worked out. And I want to help you tonight very briefly, three helpful understandings where it says work out your salvation. It says work out, not work for. Right. Huge. Big, this, the big understanding there. That's where a lot of people fall off the wagon. Some people have read it saying, is Paul saying I must work for my salvation? By no means, no. Paul is the, the greatest proponent of the fact that what Christ has done on the cross is enough. There is no works that can add to it. There's no good deeds that can add to it. It's faith and faith alone in the Son of God alone. Work out, not work for. But secondly, he does say work out. 
and work out the, 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 the word, understand that word is actually put some effort in, put some energy into it, cultivate your faith. And there's a scripture in Ephesians 2 verse 8 to 10. It's this, I love how Paul puts it. He says this, he says those two things in one go. He says, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, that no one can boast. Yeah. Beautiful. We're working out, not working for. But hold on. Keep reading. For we are God's handiwork, yeah. created in Christ Jesus to do good works, yeah. which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, you see that. Good works aren't opposed to our salvation. Getting our salvation, yes, we cannot earn our salvation, but actually we are created once we've been saved that actually that salvation will propel us to good works. Yeah. It's beautiful. I love the way that Paul does that. And, and a third understanding, we work out, not work for, but we do work out. We do put effort, energy in. But I love this understanding. When it says, I, I just work it out. It's not, it's not working it out, meaning figure it out, because I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm still trying to figure it out, this whole thing out. So it's not like trying to look in a manual for me when I get the car manual out. I start looking at the radiator and this. I can't even jumpstart my own car. Wayne will testify. And I, you know, if someone says work it out, I, I start freaking out if I'm trying to work it out. The implication is on the emphasis. He's saying work it out. More and understand, mental picture for you is like a, a tube of toothpaste. Work it out. It's in there already. You've been got it secure, but now work it out and put it to use. That's what it means, work it out. Not figure it out, but work it out. Because this is the deep understanding about, uh, about salvation. Because this is the salvation, and the Bible puts it this way, it says that you are saved. There was a day that you gave your life to Jesus, and the blood of Jesus was enough, and that was, it was settled. You are saved. Yeah. The Bible also in the New Testament says that you are being saved. And it doesn't put the first one null and void. It adds to it, gives it a fuller picture of salvation, saying you are being saved every day. And it says gloriously, one day when Christ appears, you will be saved. I love it. Don't have to figure it all out, but you've got to work it out, what God has put inside of you. The best understanding for me is that of my marriage. I got married on the 22nd of February, 2014, to the most beautiful woman in the world named Fiona. And it was a glorious day. I can remember the day. It was, it was like a movie before me. And on that day, the 22nd of February, I was married. Yeah. But can I tell you, ever since then, every day, I've been working out my marriage with fear and trembling. <laughs> From time to time. But it is that. But my marriage is not because of one day I got, yes, I was married. But I, well, I became married. But now I've been working out what it means to be married every single day. And this is the understanding that actually when Jesus died for us, his death for us, the book of Peter tells us, he, Peter tells us that actually he died for us to cleanse us of our sins. But why? The ultimate why is not just to cleanse us of our sins. Yeah. The cleansing of our sins was to bring us to God. Yeah. That is the high point. We get God. Beautiful. It's not yeah. some theological thing we have to understand. We have to lay hold of him, the one who's laid a hold of us. And then this incredible text says, with fear and trembling. And those words should fill us with fear and trembling. Yeah. I, I must be honest, there's words I wish I could skip over, wish I could brush over. But I won't tell you, many people, as I've said before, translate the fear and trembling with the words reverence or respect. The problem with that is there are Hebrew and Greek words for reverence and respect that are not those words. Yeah. I will tell you, the word for fear that's used here is phobos. And guess what fear, phobos means? Fear. Yeah. And trembling is tremos in Greek. And what tremos means is trembling. <laughs> trembling and fear mean fear and trembling. There's, not, there's no like didactic way that you can get out of this. And actually, I want to help. The best way for me to understand this was, yes, uh, is I once went to Victoria Falls, seventh wonder in the world, this incredible majestic sight of the smoke that thunders, Mosia Tunia, just it's, you see the smoke from miles and miles away. And as you get closer and closer, the roar is deafening. And you start, you, the pictures don't do it justice. And I remember going as a little boy and feeling very, very small, smaller than uh, my 25 kgs would have suggested at the time, very small. But as I went and I got closer and closer, you can go down to a little place called the Devil's Cauldron. We're standing right on the precipice. And there's just this rickety little fence between you and the smoke that thunders. And it's crashing down, crashing. And it's, it is so beautiful. It is so captivating. You can't take your eyes off it. You can't hear anything out. The, wet, the water is just is, is soaking you. And can I tell you, in that moment, I am one step away, one loose step away from certain death.
that actually that we need to get a glimpse of God that stirs us out of our lukewarm apathy and indifference. If your heart is apathetic and indifference to God, do not leave this place. Do not leave the screen tonight without crying out, God, God, rescue me. Give me a glimpse of your glory. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But this is the next part. It says this, in view of his example and his exaltation. Work it out. Not work for it, but work it out. Work it out of that tube. Get it out of what God has placed inside you. You've got God with fear and trembling. Next part says, for it is God who works in you. Oh, I just love that line. I love that line. Because here Paul is saying, God himself comes into you. Christ lives in you. And that line is so almost like trite in evangelicalism. Christ lives in you. It's like, yeah, that's cool. No, no, no. Jesus, the creator of the world, lives inside of us. And what is he doing? He's empowering us. So you've got in view of his, his uh, exaltation, in view of his example, now in view of his empowerment. At the beginning is his example and his exaltation, Jesus is Lord. And at the end is his empowering, his empowering power for us to do this. And I want to say this moment, plug into that source. It's, it's, can you imagine me now? And, and I know this might be hard for many of you because I am a guy who does not do power tools. But imagine there was a, a big, uh, a, bo- a big of block of wood that needs to be cut and there's a power tool over here and the cord is not plugged in and I've got it here. Many people approach this verse just going, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Not with the beginning, the, the, not with the two parentheses on either side, not understanding the context. And what they do is they don't plug it in, but they use that power tool and they just try and hammer that wood apart. And they make, might make some effort, but the thing just stays and falls off and they're wondering why I'm not making any progress. Paul is not saying bludgeon this thing and try really hard, grit your teeth and just work it out. No, he's saying this, for it is God who works in you. Plug into the source. Get that power tool, plug it in and wow, there's power. This is incredible. You see, I want to tell you that this command is based not on a threat, but on a promise and of power. It's not of a God standing over you saying, if you do not. It's a God saying, I am in you working this for you. And I love this. That goes on. It says, for it is God who works in you to will and to act. And this is huge. We have to understand this for our joy. This is what God is trying to do inside of us is that he has given us new hearts. It says to will and to act. He has given us new hearts. The, uh, the, the prophet Ezekiel tells us that we had an old one of flesh, an old one of stone that was cut away. Literally, God did surgery on our hearts. When we gave our lives to Jesus and he put in a new heart of flesh. Not, uh, and not only a new heart, he's given us new desires. And new desires. And I want to tell you now, sir, ma'am, wherever you sit, I want to tell you if you're a new creation in Christ Jesus, your deepest desire is to serve him. Now, don't hear me wrong. That's your deepest desire. It's not desire. It's not always your strongest desire. See, that's what faith is working out your salvation is this, is that my deepest desire is that I want to serve Jesus. I want to be a prisoner of the Lord. I don't want to be a prisoner of my lusts, my emotions, my greeds, my wants, my selfishness. I want to be a prisoner of joy. But it's not always my strongest desire, and that's how I need to learn to say no to that strongest desire, to feed the greater desire that He's placed inside of me. That's what happened years ago. Porn addiction ruled my life, and that was the strongest desire. Although my deepest desire was to serve Him, I seemed to be constrained to this addiction. Till one day I confessed and said, Jesus is Lord, not pornography, not my lusts. Jesus is Lord. And I want to work out my salvation. I don't want to just have that one day win. That's okay, good enough. I want to walk in that power now. And this power was willing and acting inside of me and walked me through that. But can I tell you, every single day, I have that, op- desire, that opportunity. Will I feed my deepest desire, which is to serve Him, or the strongest desire of my flesh in this moment? And I get to choose which one I'll feed, which one I'll give into. And I want to say right now, if your strongest desire overpowers your deepest desire again and again and again, I want to say maybe there's one of two things. Maybe you're not saved. Maybe you haven't had a new heart put in yet. Or secondly, maybe you've given in so many times to the strongest desire, you've actually quenched the Spirit of God in your life. Now I want to tell you, both of those are not hopeless. Call on the name of the Lord. Call on the name of the Lord. Do not be comfortable in your apathy. Do not be comfortable in lukewarm response to this King, this hope, this joy. You see, this is huge. I want to tell you, this, this text lands and says why? To will and to act. And the next part says in order to fill his good purpose. The NIV says to fill his good purpose. The ESV says to fulfill his good pleasure. I don't know what to do with that. There's two different translations. One says to fulfill God's purpose. And the other says we do this to fulfill God's pleasure. 
which one is right? And my answer is yes. They are both right. That we are doing this to, for His purpose is His pleasure. And His pleasure and His desire, His will is for you to have joy. He is not a cosmic killjoy. He is not the arbitrary speed limits on the road. No, no, He is the road saying, I am the way to joy. Follow me and you'll get life. And this is huge. I want to remind us, therefore, because of His example, He laid Himself low. Because of His exaltation, because He is Lord, work out your salvation. Not for it, but work it out. What Christ has put inside you with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you. He is empowering you to do it. He is for you. He is not against you. He is breathing life into you. And we obey because of His example, because of His exaltation, because of His empowering. That's why we obey. And then it goes on, for time's sake, I won't get into it, but we get to the charge of Paul. On the backdrop of this, he says, I want to tell you, whatever happens inside of you in working out your salvation, it has ramifications for a watching world and for a community that's around you. This is not a personal journey. This is not just for you and I. This was never meant to be a private faith. We're going public with this thing. He says this, he says, shine like stars in the heaven before a crooked and depraved generation. Shine, hold on to the word of faith. And he goes on and says this, he says, and like him follow his lead, pour out his life like a drink offering. And I love this because this is an image that Paul is giving us that is not of a pull yourself together type faith. No, it's a pour yourself out for him type of faith. Why? Because Jesus is our example who poured himself out for us. And I love that. I love that. Paul can say this because he's not superhuman. He's just you and like you and I, like us, with strong desires that were pulling him this way and that way, but he had to again and again say, no, my deepest desire is going to take over. And he was empowered by the same Spirit of Jesus that wants to empower you. He had taken on the nature of a servant just like Jesus. He had understood that Jesus is Lord just like us. And you understand what Jesus did. And I want to tell you in this moment what Christ did as we land. I want to remind us that we can work out our salvation because Christ poured himself out. Paul is saying that we can pour our lives out for this world, pour our lives out for our spouses, pour our lives out for bosses who do not deserve it. We can pour out our lives for Jesus and the gospel, not because we are great, but because Jesus has done it for us. And I want to tell you, on that cross, that's why this, this whole gravitational pull is chapter 2. And the opening verse is telling us about Christ and His response, being obedient unto death, taking on the nature of a servant. On our behalf was that when He died, when Christ died for you and I, He was poured out. He was poured out, not just trickled, but poured out. He was poured out for you and I. He was poured out. His blood was poured out for you and I. And I want to tell you, His heart was poured out for us. His desires were poured out. His his pleasures were poured out to you and I. His affections were poured out. And it flowed. It flowed from Emmanuel's veins to your weakest point, to your most broken spaces, to your most fallen areas, to where you feel weak, where you feel betrayed, where you feel abused. His blood pours and pours and pours. And it's not a Savior saying, work it out, boy. far you feel his grace pours for you and I and this is the good news of the gospel he humbled himself and humbled comes from the root word humiliation he was humiliated on our behalf so we could find life that no matter how low you feel right now maybe you say I do not have strength to start this journey Gabe I say sir ma'am you great is he who lives in you then he's in the world in your marriage right now if it's on the rocks pour yourself out Work it out. Work out your salvation. Pour yourself out in view of His mercy. In view of His example, His exaltation, His empowering. Pour yourself out in your finances. Pour yourself out in your relationships. Pour yourselves out in your church. Pour yourself out in your workplace. Pour yourself out. If your heart is lacking joy, pour out yourself. and Find Him to be more than enough. Paul is after our joy. And Jesus is after our joy. Whatever happens, life changes church. We have a Savior who is more than enough. Father, I pray for every heart listening. Right now, I thank you, Father God, for your grace. Meet them at their point of need. Meet them in their lack. Meet them in their weakness. Meet them in that place. And with the encouragement of heaven, come and say, Therefore, because of my example, because of my exaltation, because of my empowering, you can work out your salvation. You can work it out because I have poured it out. You have everything you need. I thank you, Father God. You're after our joy. Tonight, we bind our wandering hearts to you. 
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.